athletes have to retire. I've been doing this for 14 years. I've been a professional athlete for almost 20 years. And the body doesn't just keep going and going and going. So uh, my time has come, and, and there are many, many other things that I need to do in life. This is, has been a dream of mine for a long time. And whenever I watch sport, whatever sport it may be, I love to see the guy go out on top. And I would love to try and do that. Uh, but I've decided that the Tour de France will be my last race as a professional cyclist. Good evening. Welcome to Lance Armstrong's Leaving Two. We're on the small island of Noirmoutier off the Vendée coast to kick off the 2005 Tour de France. About as close to America as you can get here without actually being in the Atlantic. And the American who's won the last six editions of this race is going for an historic seventh. Now, in normal circumstances, that'd be more than enough to keep us going for the next three weeks. But Armstrong is after something more. Publicly and in advance, he set himself a task that not even Muhammad Ali or Michael Jordan could pull off. The trick of bowing out at the very pinnacle of his sport with a final brilliant flourish and no encores. If things go to plan for Armstrong, he'll step off the winner's podium in Paris on July the 24th, straight into non-negotiable retirement. In other words, leaving the race the way he's always ridden it, on his own terms. How are you finding your first Tour de France at the moment? Uh, it's a good, good time. You glad to be here? Very glad. This one, Fabio, is for you. I thought of him every second. On Wednesday, October 2nd, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. I've never cried a lot, but the last, the last week I, I cry all the time, and, and that helps, I think. This. He took a look straight into the eyes there of Jan Ulrich and said, well, here I go, are you coming or not? And the answer is, not. Oh, and Belocki's in, Belocki's gone down. Armstrong's off the road as well. This is unbelievable. I've never seen this before. Armstrong was waiting for somebody to pull in the flag, and now it was even... Oh, oh look up there. Down. What has happened there? for the last time. There's plenty of other stuff Lance has to face for the last time on this farewell tour, starting with a 21 camera salute that greets his arrival every year. Then into his annual pre-race press conference where he made it clear that he hasn't come just to do a lap of honor. Every day will be special, every finish will be special, but I can't let the, that feeling and that emotion um, interfere with what I'm trying to do here because it's, uh, for me, it's not a a promenade around France. I'm, I'm still trying to win, um, but I have to balance the two. And, and many times I'll be sad about it, and many times I'll be happy about it, because there are days when you're, you really wish that you didn't have to do that ever again. Right, let's take a look now at the route facing Armstrong and the rest of the field. 3,608 kilometers spread over 23 days. And there's no going west from here unless Lance plans to ride on water as a farewell party piece. So after stage one, it's east and inland across the upper third of France. Then it's all for one and hell for leather in the team time trial. Armstrong's Discovery squad have won the last two and they'll be favourites to take time off Jan Ulrich's T-Mobile and even Basso's CSC. 
Ulrich's ultimate objective, of course, is Paris, but he's got the home market to take care of on the way there. Stage 7 takes the tour into Germany, where all the local riders will be looking for a bit of face time. Stage 8 takes it out again, and after a rest day in Grenoble, it's up to ski lift altitude with the first three stages in the Alps. That's generally the cue for Armstrong to check his rearview mirror, put his foot down, and see who can follow. No rest day in between the Alps and the Pyrenees this year, just a long haul across country before the road rears up again. Stage 15 is possibly the toughest of the entire tour. Eight and a half thousand metres of climbing and six mountain summits to conquer. The last of them at the finish line, Bad Day, where Armstrong won four years ago. After the Pyrenees, it's a bumpy right turn inland. They're left at the 50-foot statue of the Virgin Mary in Le puy en velay and on to Saint-Étienne for stage 20, the only individual time trial in this year's tour after today's. That should be decisive if the mountains haven't been, meaning it's safe for the survivors to relax and look forward to Paris. Now, the fact that it's Lance Armstrong's last tour means that it's Jan Ulrich's last chance to beat him. Ulrich has been second to Armstrong three times, so he knows it's now or never. And the day before the start of the race, it was almost never. Out wrecking the time trial course, he went through the rear windscreen of his team car from the outside. He'd been slipstreaming close behind it, apparently, and didn't react quickly enough when it braked. Amazingly, given the damage to the car, Jan's injuries were mainly to his dignity, along with some small cuts to his neck from the glass. He emerged from hospital wearing possibly the biggest plaster in the French health system and declared himself fit to start. Well, he was obviously going to be a bit stiff come the opening time trial, and there was no hiding place along the course. A long, exposed 19-kilometre run from Fromentine on the mainland across to Noirmoutier. The best of the early finishers was a man making his tour debut, David Zabriskie of CSC in the USA. Well, here he comes. Dave Zabriskie has led at every time check. He's going to now lead at the finish. 20 minutes 51. That will take some beating. Zabriskie's time held for the next three hours. In fact, Alexander Vinokurov of T-Mobile and Laszlo Bedrogi of Credit Agricole were the only men to get within a minute of it. As we pick up the action, Jan Ulrich and even Basso are already out on the course, and only Lance Armstrong is left to start. It's a familiar sight, isn't it? Six times the winner. He has 66 yellow jerseys over those years, since 1999. He wants to go out on a high. The odds say he won't, because all of the big winners of the Tour have never done this. They've always gone out being a flop in the last Tour. There's Cheryl Crow and she is going to cheer him all the way. And there's the man who has always had his faith in Lance Armstrong on the right there is Jim Okovitz. I think everybody expects this man to turn the tour upside down yet again. He's on his way. He's on his way. He's pulled his foot out of the clip right at the start there. That will lose him a couple of seconds, and that might just ruffle his feathers a little bit. That was a quick start by Armstrong. Looks down there to see and make sure that it's OK. Gets into the aerodynamic position. But that was a rather bizarre thing to happen to Armstrong. So let's have a look at it one more time. Just as he accelerates away, pulls out his foot. Fortunately, that's at the start. He would have lost one or two seconds there. Well, they tell us how unpopular he is with the crowd as we go to George Hincapie. Did you hear the cheers there? I often think the press sometimes get it slightly wrong. But here is George Hincapie licking his lips, beating Lance once this year. Can he do it again? He's not going to beat Dave Zabriskie, the team that to discover he gave up and allowed him to leave because Zabriskie still leads as Hincapie comes over. Even so, he's in third place with that time. George has done it again. That's a great ride. Great ride for a man who started his career as a sprinter as we go back down to have a look here at Lance Armstrong but the Americans are having a fabulous day of racing because currently they're occupying first and third place on day one well America once never took part in cycle racing but now they seem to be dominating at this particular cycle race there's the crowds and they're all straining forward now to catch a glimpse of Lance Armstrong the only man who's won the Tour de France six times in his history he's won 21 stages
stages of the tour and 10 of them have been alone against the watch and you will note that he's actually not wearing the yellow jersey which a few years ago the man, the last man to start the winner of the previous season always used to wear the yellow jersey armstrong only wants to wear the yellow jersey when he actually feels that he's earned it we've got a chance here just to look at both riders the comparison between the two men at the top of the sport on the left lance armstrong wearing number one on the right jan ulrich and look at the difference in cadence the ulrich uses a monster gear a huge gear he is a powerhouse of a man where on the other hand armstrong is very supple pedals at around about 100 rpm that strange little nervous move that he's had every time i've seen him ride a time trial he puts his hand round to the back of his shorts just to pull them tightly to make sure he's as aerodynamic as possible well, there he is, the big man, his pedalling style is so different to Lance Armstrong. He just pounds that big gear. He's going over the only undulation on the course. You climb up to the dizzy heights. Right in the distance there is the famous Passage du Gois. It's covered by water just now, but that was where Alex Zula lost his Tour de France when he fell off back in 1999. He still finished second to Lance. Phil, I thought you told me the French had said there weren't any crowds out on the race today. <laughs> well, they've moved around a bit, but uh, you're quite right. Right, they, they can't get over onto the island. This is the only entrance to the island, and the roads have been closed since 9 o'clock this morning. It's now coming up local time to 10 minutes to 7, so you haven't been able to get onto the island at all, or indeed off it, uh, since 9 o'clock this morning. We're looking now at the face of Lance Armstrong. Already he will know how his body feels, just how he's going, whether it's going good for him. He will not be chasing the time of uh, Zabriskie. Yeah, Armstrong looking very strong there, he really had a fluid pedalling action as he hit the uh, most difficult part of today's climb as we move uh, three minutes up the road here to Ivan Abasa. Where's number 21, the third overall in the Tour de France last year and this year looking to try and see if he can make himself get up onto the podium once again. Now, one minute behind Ivan Basso is the powerhouse, the man who already has won himself a time trial this year in the Tour of Switzerland at Jan Ulrich, five times second in this great event, and this year hoping to take one of the most famous scalps in the sport. He wants to beat Lance Armstrong if he can before he retires, because he said that would add so much more to a victory if he could beat the man who is the record holder. Armstrong has gone through three seconds slower than Zabriskie in second. Well, uh, we were talking to his coach just before the start of the event and he said I think Armstrong is going to win the Tour de France this year by his biggest ever margin he is almost equal the time of Dave Zabriskie at 9.6 kilometers six kilometers covered and that you see is an unbelievable performance just three seconds off for Armstrong he's now got himself right into the times to win this stage well there's still 10 kilometers to ride of course but Zabriskie now will be quaking he may see his dream beaten by the man who's broken many people's dreams over the last seven years of the Tour de France Lance Armstrong just three seconds off and that was despite pulling his foot off the pedal which could well have cost him that three seconds it could have cost him that one to three seconds but he didn't seem to panic at all he got his foot back in very quickly he looks here to be riding with absolute power but look at that machine he's invested a lot of time and money into that machine Phil it's probably the most aerodynamic bike you could actually buy on the open market well, you know, he's always delivered the goods when the chips are down. He knows the time of Zabriskie because it's been standing for so long today. But Tero is continuing to carry on. Former world time trial champion, just 21st. Phil, if you look at those time gaps, Armstrong was pulled back around about 40 seconds on the man wearing the pink jersey here, Jan Ulrich. If we could pull back, I don't well. think we would have to look back very far to see, and that's what we're going to do just now, the position of Lance Armstrong. There's the police motorbikes clearing the way for Armstrong there is Armstrong that's not very much more than 10 seconds separating the two men it's decision time already and we've only done 10 kilometers in the Tour de France but if they're losing this sort of time what's a, there is Jan Ulrich right in the distance Armstrong has galloped across a gap of almost one minute and he could be putting Jan Ulrich out of the Tour on day number one this is unthinkable well the big discussions the banter the exchange of remarks over the last couple of months I want to beat him Armstrong very often rallied those with the sparring remarks of I'm not too worried about 
Jan Ulrich rendezvous in July. Today is the 2nd of July. Armstrong on the left-hand side. You can almost see the slowness creeping into the position of Jan Ulrich. Let's not forget, don't take away from Ulrich, Phil. He had a nasty tumble yesterday. Mm, that is absolutely true. But watching Lance Armstrong again, it makes me wonder what the Ministry of Youth and Sport think of this now. They chose to take one rider for a random drugs test yesterday, and it was Lance Armstrong. So Armstrong chose to walk them all, the inspectors, in front of a crowd of photographers and press and make them do the test in his team bus. And uh, he was the only random after everybody on the tour had done the compulsory drug test the day before. Heras is in, 23.09. Not going to annoy anybody today, but at the moment, conceding probably two and a half minutes if he keeps this up to Lance Armstrong. This is the catch. This could be what Lance Armstrong needs to actually win the stage. He's had in front of him a carrot, like a carrot or a strawberry in front of a donkey. He's been looking to try and catch it. This, to me, is a little piece of cycling history because Armstrong is on the wheel there of Ulrich and he's blown by him. Oh, and he took one glance, Ulrich, and he's gone. Now the rules are you can't follow in the slipstream. Armstrong goes through best time of the check, 16.47, three seconds better than Zabriskie. At the same time, he catches uh, Jan Ulrich. That's what he wanted. He wanted to catch Jan Ulrich. That was the little piece of a recipe that he needed. He needed to get out there and make a statement on day one. But to go through the 15-kilometre time check, the time, 16 minutes and 47 seconds, he's overtaken Zabriskie. He's got a roundabout four kilometers to go to the finish now two and a half miles it should not take him at this speed Phil very much more than four minutes and 20 uh, seconds well what does Ulrich think right now he can't afford to let this man ride away from him the regulation stage you must have a 25 meter gap well I think we can say he's got that right now because I think Armstrong is pulling away from him he's pulling away but Ulrich will dig deep because Ulrich is a proud man he's a former winner of the Tour de France let's not forget back in 1997 he's a great bike rider he's a powerful man you do have to bear in the back of your mind that he had a very nasty crash yesterday, but he did get up to fight again. Armstrong in the blue and white jersey there of Team Discovery is now looking at the possibility of winning this opening stage. The time to beat is that of Dave Zabriskie, 20 minutes and 51 seconds. And Armstrong at the last check was three seconds up on Zabriskie. Well, he picked him up at just inside the three kilometers to go, Banner. That was two kilometers to go now. And uh, Ulrich is going to have to hold him in his sights. He's going to concede at least 62 seconds before we go out onto the open roads tomorrow. Armstrong has done what he said he would do and take time on day one. Paul, we just knew when we spoke to Lance in the Dauphiné Libre, we said it to each other. He didn't say it. He's got his best form of his life. He think I think he has got the best form of his life. You know, he went through the 15-kilometer time check, 16.46. That was three seconds faster than Zavrisky. Also faster faster than Alexander Vinokurov and his own teammate George Hincapie at that point was in fifth place but yes in the Dauphiné Libre Phil I think he was enjoying himself he rode as a, just a training ride he was preparing himself for the Tour de France he didn't want to affect the outcome of the event but he was never too far away from the leaders well I don't know but I don't think that uh, Jan Ulrich has ever been caught in a time trial before now he's been caught by Lance Armstrong and has passed him here meanwhile we switch up towards the finishing line and this is Ivan Basso now his time has got to be close at least to Ulrich to stay in this race for a few days. Lance uh, Armstrong has got a big decision to make. Is he going to be the first man to lead the tour start to finish since 1934? Or will he not defend the jersey tomorrow? We won't know those answers just yet. But he's got to consider that possibility now. What a way to go out of the Tour de France. That would be. Basso finishes and his time will wait for the confirmation. It's 18th place anyway. And 22-17 it is confirmed at just coming in just behind him you caught a glimpse there of Francisco Mancebo so Basso did a pretty reasonable time there he called the man who started one minute in front of him but the man who is now looking at trying to win this stage is Lance Armstrong Phil and he's in the final bend well as he swings up towards the line he's going to win he's got about eight seconds to get to it though Zabriskie at 20 51 it's going to be close 47 48 49 50 51 Zabriskie's won the stage Zabriskie has won the stage Armstrong finishes second 
three. Can you believe that? Just inside of two seconds, Armstrong was behind Dave Zabriskie. Ulrich, by the way, for the record, came in in 12th place. Armstrong was so very close there, and I wonder how much the, the weather conditions affected that performance. But if you look at that man, Phil, I think we are looking at a man who is ready for the Tour de France. The attempt to try and win it for seven times in a row, that is a little piece of history. 20 minutes, 51 seconds on the bike, three hours of waiting, and a win by two seconds. Sabrisky, Armstrong, Vinokorov was the one, two, three, with a great ride from George Hincapie to take fourth. Lord Landis making it four Americans in the top six. So the yellow jersey on his tour debut for David Zabriskie, only the third American to wear it, incidentally, the other two being Lance Armstrong and Greg LeMond. I don't know if we'll be defending it for me, uh, but it could be an advantage for the team to be at the front in the coming stages. What did, what did the team manager say to you? Because I don't think I've ever seen Bjarne Reese so happy. He was very happy for you and for the team. He just said, good job, and you're the best, and he loves me. <laughs> In terms of the race overall, though, the real story was behind Zabriskie, and more accurately, behind Armstrong. Missing out on the yellow jersey by a couple of seconds will be nothing to Lance compared to the damage he's done to his major rivals. Paul Rick had lost 106 to the defending champion, perhaps his job as leader of T-Mobile, because he was also beaten by his teammate, Alexander Vinokorov. In fact, he was even beaten by one of Armstrong's teammates, George Hincapie. But so were plenty of others. Ulrich was 12th, Ivan Basso, the Italian challenger, 20th. And down the list, the damage got worse. Andreas Clurden, who was second overall to Armstrong last year, was 50 places behind him, two minutes down. And Ivan Mayo, the Spanish climber, already over three minutes in arrears. So, a dramatic opening stage in the Tour, and I'm joined by a man who knows all about them, Chris Boardman, who has won three prologues in his career. Chris. David Zabriskie did a great ride. Let's put that aside for a moment and talk about the damage that Lance Armstrong did to his main rivals, chief among them, of course, Jan Ulrich. Well, he certainly has. I mean, he does this every year. He gives people the, these huge shocks. Uh, uh, the difference this year, of course, he did it on stage one, and it really has got to have a lot of people thinking about their strategies and what they're going to do from here. Well, what is Ulrich going to do from here? I mean, he wasn't just beaten by Armstrong, he was beaten by his own teammate Alexander Vinokurov. Has he lost the leadership of T-Mobile? Well, that's got to be a question for, 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 for T-Mobile, of course, but uh, Vinokurov produced probably the time trial of his life there. Fantastic performance, and you watched him thrusting his bike across the line. He wasn't riding like somebody who was there for support only, so if they want to change the mantle, I think he's ready to take it on. Ivan Basso came in behind Ulrich and lost a little bit more time on Armstrong, but then he's not such a great time trialist anyway, so, so not so demoralising for him. No, it was a very respectable performance, perhaps uh, not, as, not as fantastic as they'd have hoped, but he didn't lose a, a super massive amount of time, but he's still very much in the hunt. And um, Floyd Landis must be pretty happy, uh, you know, an old Armstrong teammate in sixth place, he must be pretty happy with his ride. I think so. Uh, the difficulty for, for Floyd will be that his team isn't quite as strong uh, as the other two, uh, and that's going to perhaps cause him a few more problems than, than uh, he might have liked. Finally, and a disastrous time trial. We know he's a climber, not a time trialist, but for Ivan Mayo to lose over three minutes to Armstrong is just a catastrophe, isn't it? I think when you put a nearly 20 kilometre time trial pan flat as the opening stage, it's the kind of thing that's going to happen, and he's just got to, got to deal with that. But for him now, he's really up against it, and to claw back that amount of time is going to take something superhuman. Now the action on stage two is spread over 181 kilometres from Chalon down the Atlantic coast and inland to Les Essars. And apart from a small climb with about 15 kilometres to go, it's perfect for a sprint finish. And despite an early breakaway, that's what it's starting to look like as we join the race heading into Les Essars. Well, this is a ride of Sonia Duval. I think it's Nicolas Fitch, the Frenchman, who's trying to get away from the front. Again, they're all massing, and he's got a little bit of a gap. You can't control everyone. And, uh, in fact, Francaise de Gio wants somebody else to come and pick up the pace now. So this sort of uh, arguing amongst yourselves can give you a surprise result at two kilometres to go. Looks like uh, Fonak moving up there. No, it's Licky Gas moving up there on the right-hand side, trying to keep themselves, uh, trying to keep themselves nice and organised, making sure that it's not very... Difficult. It's Sabala, the man from Sonier Duval, who got off the front, but now that has completely disappeared, Phil, because he's going to get wiped away with this, and it seems, too, as if Francaise de Jure have lost control. 
they have they've been swept here by leaky gas remember we've got uh, the big Swede rider in here Magnus Backstedt who is another bad finish himself and uh, Luciano Pagliarini who we've seen in different team colors ride well in the Tour de Lankawi in Malaysia he wants to get a grip of the Tour de France too but look at the rush now the right hand side had it with leaky gas on the front but here comes the rush up the inside it's all beginning to change again and when we get to the kite at one to go it is going to be one sprint for the line as they try to bring Tom Boonen up through on the rails and now, now you've got the team of Lotto Robbie McEwen's team there's Leon Van Bon what? moving up into about third or fourth position everyone now starting to panic inside the final kilometer this is the moment when you have to take all kinds of risks if you slip back now there is no second chance you've got to look out for Brad McGee a quick flick there as we go across to the left hand side it looks like the left hand side is Licky Gas trying to lift it all up but Tom Boone has stopped there right in the middle that's Maggie Backstead the Swedish rider who's got the front now is trying to look for uh, his Pagliarini his teammate but as they start the swing Max has made a mistake there and now here comes the lead out for Tom Boone and young Kersey Poo's getting into the mix too he's sitting there round the corner in fourth wheel this could be a very Robert Foster is there too in second wheel and Baden Cook is the white jersey bouncing a little bit off the shoulders as they swing up to the home state Foster goes on the far right here and now this is going to be a big run Robbie McEwen is coming on the rails Robbie McEwen is opening up the sprint Tom Bonin is trying to get over the top of him as they come up to the line it's Bonin and McEwen and Tom gets it what a finish Tom Bonin was in the ideal position there he was perfectly set up by his teammate he was doing a magnificent job there McEwen thought he got it went a little bit too early took the advantage but the rest of the main field comes in with exactly the same time but Tom Boone and there's the yellow jersey coming across there nice and safely no problems at all for Dave Zabriskie but Tom Boone and despite the toothache he complained about <laughs> overnight Phil came out today with very sharp teeth what a sprint the two top sprinters of years gone by there they are Mano o oh Mano, shoulder to shoulder, but Bonin, much the bigger, bulkier man, seemed to have the power this time. Alan Davis off to the right there, another Australian up amongst the leaders as well, but that was one big win. Yes, Tom, you do look pretty happy. He looks very happy indeed. They set him up for what will be his 12th win of the season. Let's just have another quick look at there. McEwen started charging down the right-hand side there, but all of a sudden, almost like Alessandro Pataki with the incredible incredible power that he's nurtured over the last couple of seasons it was a cruise to the line for Tom Boonen just ahead of Robbie McCune in third place so there's the full result the man who won the final road stage of last year's tour wins the first of this year's and it wasn't just Tom Boonen who got past Robbie McEwen in the closing yards but Tor Hushoff too McEwen's fellow Aussie Stuart O'Grady was fourth behind them the big names from Z to A Zabriskie to Armstrong all finished safely in the bunch well, it's Bonin's third win, and it's only his second tour. But he's after more than stage wins this year. He's targeted the green jersey. And on the evidence of the way he blew past the defending champion, Robbie McEwen, today, he's got every chance of securing it. Was it about timing or power? Uh, it was timing and power. Uh, it was a hard finish, so he had to go in the right time, right moment. And uh, Robbie started sprinting to the right. Uh, I managed to follow him and pass him straight away on the right moment. Now, usually the winner of the first road stage takes the yellow jersey too, but this year the time gaps from the opening time trial were too big, and David Zabriskie looks safe until the team time trial on Tuesday, which means he's going to have to come up with an answer to this question. Okay, and what are you going to do with the second line? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You hadn't thought about that, had you? I hadn't thought about that. Okay, enjoy tomorrow. Thank you. Let's have a look at the overall standings now. Two lines of Brisky still leads by two seconds over Lance Armstrong. But Laszlo Bedrogi has jumped a couple of places to third, thanks to 12 seconds worth of sprint bonuses that he picked up during the breakaway. And the gaps stay the same all the way down the line through Ulrich and Basso to the last man, Leonardo Pipoli, who's already nearly five minutes adrift. So, a good old-fashioned sprinter stage to get us started on the open road in this year's tour. And Chris, after the incredible drama of the opening time trial, more like business as usual with the big lads up front. Yeah, I think you'd call that pretty much a textbook sprinter stage, really. Uh, I think one thing they were really lucky with today is it wasn't very windy. Light wind meant those crosswinds didn't cause a lot of problem, and the crash count was pretty low. Are those the names we're going to be seeing up there all the way through the tour for the for the green jersey competition and the sprints? Bonin, Hushoft, uh, McEwen. Cook was a little bit further back today. I think pretty much so. If you look at that top ten, it'll give you a good flavour for who's going to be here uh, to play. But I certainly wouldn't count on it always being the same the same person. Certainly Tom Boonham was strong and we saw we saw Torton Shoft coming through very fast.
Now, winning stages in the first few days is one thing. Surviving the mountains and still having enough fast twitch muscle fibre left to win again in the final week is another. And the man who has lasted the pace the best over two out of the last three tours is the defending champion, Robbie McEwen. Keep your eyes on the front. McEwen always comes out best when the going gets rough. He is to the bunch sprint what wasps are to a picnic on a summer's day. Small, persistent and extremely irritating to those around him. I think what makes me difficult for those guys is they never quite know what I'm going to do because I don't know it yet. I don't know until I do it. Um, and it's not, not like I'm not there and then I'm suddenly there. I think people think I'm not there because they can't quite see me because I'm sitting behind a big guy like Bourne and a Hussoft. It was a tactic which served him well last summer, carrying him to two stage wins and ultimately the green jersey, although that's not his major goal this year. I want to win stages. Sort of, you know, obviously the last couple of years I've thought about it quite a lot, about the competition and uh, what it means and, and how it feels to, to go for it. And there's a, a different sort of feeling that winning a stage is that adrenaline rush, the excitement of winning a stage at that moment. The green jersey, when you finally get to Paris and, and it is yours, it's more just a uh, sense of relief. Relief and a return to winning ways last year. In 2003, he'd finished shoulder to shoulder with fellow Aussie Baden Cook on the Champs Elysees and lost out. Cook's challenge didn't materialise last year, but he'll be a stronger threat again this summer. But perhaps it's yesterday's stage winner Tom Bonin who poses the biggest threat. He certainly thinks McEwen is the man to beat. The rivalry is brewing nicely. And Robbie is a, is a true sprinter. I'm a, a very strong sprinter, but Robbie is uh, he's made for a sprint. So uh, it will be a, a big fight and a, a nice competition, I think. My main competitor is obviously Hussoff going on, uh, from last year. Uh, Bonin, Cook, Nazon, O'Grady, Davis. Galvez, Forster, Furlan. Now there's always a number of guys and there's often someone who sort of pops up that nobody really expects. But I think I've named them all. <laughs> well, there's today's route, 212 kilometres from La Chataigneray to Tours, with only the last of them holding any real interest for the likes of Vernon and McEwen. Although, of course, there's always the chance that a breakaway might steal their thunder. Today's escapees are Eric Decker of the Dutch Rubberbank team and a home rider, Nicola Portal of Age Désert. As we pick it up on the run into Tour, they're trying to hold out for the win with the chasing pack bearing down. Three and a half kilometres to race now, 3.4. We're getting nearer and nearer the finishing line. Nicola Portal. His eyes wide open here as he tries to drive this race to the finish. It is an incredible sight here as Portal is doing the work as best he can now. And Decker just gasping, uh, saving a little bit of energy and then will do his share again. That bottle's fallen off his bike in rather a dangerous place, but they continue to race on. It's rolling to safety, thank heavens for that, as the charge of the light brigade is right behind them. But they are making a meal of this, Paul. This is the final little bend, the final circle before the riders will then line up and see the finishing line in front of them. They're just around about three kilometres to go. And once they've, once they've finished this little configuration on the road, they'll see the finishing line they're still holding on to four or five seconds advantage there is the organization the line of six riders you can see the white jerseys that's Francaise de Jeux they'll be looking after their man Baden Cook even though this morning there was a little bit of a worry which sprinter will we choose Bernard Eichel or will we choose Baden Cook I think they're going for Cookie three to go now we go under the curly line up for the finishing line here on the Avenue de Grammont in Tour and they are still clear they are desperate to reach them but they can't quite get there they're now into a confusing state the peloton they're trying to lead up to the leaders while at the same time the teams are trying to position their sprinters for the finish this could be in the home straight quite literally where it all comes together unbelievable I don't know how those two men are surviving off the front of the main field at speeds which are approaching 60 kilometers an hour. This is the Avenue de Gramont. Eric Decker has accelerated. He, won't he give still up. won't give up. He's gone again. He's been forced to move, but there is a charge down the right of the road now, and it looks like Cancellara has reached him here. It's certainly a white jersey as he comes up here, and this is a good move too because these sort of moves can play a poor old Eric Decker. Two kilometers inside two kilometers has been wiped out, and Cancellara, the rookie of the tour, the winner of the 
prologue at 2k is gonna go remember he has speed over short distances that's how he won the prologue in Liège well that's an unbelievable move he may well have just caught the sprinters at the right time there are not many men in this field who can make a move like that but Fabian Cancellara is a very good individual time trialist he's got to ride at 60 kilometers an hour if he wants to hold off the main field but he is looking Phil he is dreaming to try and see the red kite the kite that tells these riders as a kilometer to go to the finish he's gonna get swamped by the sprinters who've gone either side of the road here there's green jerseys on the front they are looking after Tor Hushoff. the white jerseys are looking very much after Baden Cook and let's not forget the man in the green jersey Tom Boone will not be very far away at all what a finish we're going to pass mm -hmm. under the kite any second now that'll be a kilometer from mm -hmm. the line mm -hmm. six tenths of a mile they're on him mm -hmm. he almost did it but Francais de Jure, Brad McGee has got control of the head of the race now looking for Baden Cook perhaps he's the boy in white to the left of our picture moves them all over Fasa mm -hmm. Bortolo getting involved in this right now Cancellata tried it wasn't to work he's back in the pack now and it looks as though Baden Cook is being lined up for this the green jersey of Tom Bolan about nine men back just dodging away now comes a charge on the right from Leaky Gas this is a desperate finish and dead straight dead straight this is the most beautiful finishing straight in the world if you're a sprinter and that's exactly what they're trying to do for Baden Cook they're trying to set him up there's the red kite everybody's in there nice and safe still F de Jeu on the front there Baden Cook will be in about fourth or fifth position you can see as well the Licky Gas riders in the lime green are starting to warm it up there you can see big Maggie Baxter right in the middle there is Jan Kersipu trying to lead out to Hushoff just over to the right hand side well the lead out has been done by Tor Hushoff's team here but he's not placed in yet Kersipu has got second wheel the champion of his country he's on the left now he's also picked up Tor Hushoff who's got right in behind him this is going to be a tough one I don't think Bonin's going to get out of this mess and I'm not sure where Robbie is yet Robbie McEwen is about five men back he's getting a perfect lead out as they start to switch Bonin's got McEwen's wheel a lot of dodging here but what's Tor Hushoff and Jan Kersipu as they go on the left here comes Tom Bonin now in the centre being challenged by McEwen and this is a desperate move again and Bowman has got the head of the first with Stuart O'Grady trying to break it a little bit of a wobble Bowman has done it again and that is an incredible second what a sprint that was everybody bouncing off everybody's shoulders and I thought for a moment Stuart O'Grady was going to win it well, definitely worth another look at that one. Boonen already won the race, but behind him, just watch that yellow helmet of McEwen. He's using his head to try and make himself a hole. Left it way too late today. He's got boxed in. He needs to make himself a gap. Stuart O'Grady, well, he's not too keen on moving out the way. And now, really, that's just ridiculous. I think the commissars are definitely going to want to look at that one. Um, there was a bit of argy-bargy in there, and your feeling is uh, some of it was a bit unnecessary. Yeah... I mean, there's certainly a few elbows and headbutts can be thrown, but uh, uh, that that was a bit bit over the top, I think. How did it uh, happen uh, from uh, from your angle? Tom Boonham was coming past you. Yeah, Tom was coming past, um, and next minute I had Robbie's head on my shoulder. Oh, uh, yeah. He wasn't trying to say sweet romantic nothings. No, he just knew he was going to get beaten. And um, what's the idea? You think the team might lodge an appeal, or will you might have words with him tomorrow? Oh, I think we'll let the commissaires decide. Um, sprinting, sprinting, you know, no, no one crashing or anything. But uh, yeah, that's probably a bit over the top. Well, the commissaires did have a look at it, and they didn't like it. McEwen clearly convicted by the video evidence and relegated to the back of the bunch, losing his green jersey points for third place in the process. Miriam Van Es, a member of the uh, jury of commissaires, can you explain how you came to the decision to declassify Robbie McEwen? Yes, of course. Uh, we saw the images uh, of uh, the sprint, and uh, seeing the sprint in itself, it was all obvious because it's not allowed what McEwen did. So it was an anonymous decision of the of the judges. Mm -hmm. A unanimous decision. Uh, can Robbie appeal? No, no appeal possible. Lucky it's not the Tour of Britain or Robbie would be up for an ASBO. And the Commissaire's decision left the stage result looking like this. Tom Burnham taking his second win in successive days ahead of Gerolsteiner's Peter Vrolik with O'Grady now third.
All the big names came in safely behind in the main bunch, and behind them, headbutting his way down to 186th, Robbie McEwen. So, not only is Tom Burnham two stage wins to the good, he's comfortably leading the green jersey competition, while McEwen, who would have been in second place, disappeared off the radar. Although, like yesterday's stage win, Burnham left it late. Yeah, I waited very, very long, but uh, I meant to, to wait as long as possible because I know stage of uh, uh, less kilometers like this is very hard to... Uh, if you're in front and they come from behind you, you're already lost. So it's better to wait and then you have two chances. One is you get slugged in, or the second is you win the stage. And uh, there's always a little bit of luck there, but uh, if you're strong and you're confident, maybe most, most of the time the luck is on your side. So. Possibly the only man in the tour happier than Bernan is David Zabriskie. Bernan was expecting stage wins, a third successive day in the yellow jersey, as more than Zabriskie could have dreamed of. No change at all in the general classification, or at least the top of it, where David Zabriskie retains his two-second lead over Lance Armstrong. Tom Bernan, though, is not just leading the points race, he's also ridden himself up into 13th place overall, just behind Jan Ulrich. There's no other sport in the world where individual success depends on group sacrifice the way it does in cycling, but the daily grind of teamwork is usually lost in a swarm of jerseys as each squad does its chores alongside the domestic staff of 20 other teams. The team time trial, though, makes it all crystal clear. Like families of non uplets each dressed in identical outfits by their mother, the teams power around the course in formation and the time is taken on the fifth man over the line. So this is where a team leader really relies on the depth of quality in his lineup. Today's team time trial course, stage four of the tour, is 67 kilometres through the Loire Valley, then over the Loire itself here just before the finish at Blois. And it's a very tricky finish to negotiate as a nine-man team. The medieval street plan here is tight and twisty, and Lance Armstrong will know better than anyone what can go wrong in team time trials. And there's a crash, crash in the postal team, there's a touch of wheels. Two riders are down here on the floor. One of them is van der Velde, I think. The right-hand side of the picture, I'm not sure where the other one is, Tyler Hamilton. But two riders are down. That was the 2001 team time trial, but Armstrong's squad has won this event in the last two tours. And most people think this year's supporting cast is the strongest he's ever had. You throw in the guys we've had around, Tricky, Chechu, who I think are better than they were last year. Acevedo is at least as good as he was last year. George, look at the way he rode in the Dolphin. Clearly, he's better than he was a year ago. So, I mean, the team is... I'm not worried about this team defending the jersey. I'm, I might be a little worried about the leader getting the jersey, but no, they, they know how to do their job. Well, there's the route, Tour de Blois, and over the 67-kilometer course, Liberty Seguros set the best early time, coming in with one hour, 11 minutes, and 32 seconds. But with all the teams out on the road as we join the stage, CSC are fastest through the second time check at 46 kilometers. Six seconds better than Discovery, and seven seconds up on T-Mobile, who are powering towards the finish. Here comes Jan Ulrich driving the train towards the line. As they head up now, they will be better than Liberty Suguros. Then it's down to the others to match the pace. This is a big demonstration by T-Mobile because they were devastated after the individual time trial. But now they are going to tell us they are back. Alexander Vinokurov is also coming up towards the finishing time now. This is going to be a fantastic time, Paul. Take it in. Well, they're pulling themselves up to the finish line. Jan Ulrich must have done some massive turns out there in the road because there you can see Ulrich has switched off that's Garini not too far away Vinokurov is very happy with his time he's taken up sixth place there but the time they're looking to beat is the time of Liberty Seguros it's going to be very close indeed 1.11.32 is the time to beat but 1.11.15 is the time of T-Mobile so T-Mobile the team of Jan Ulrich and look at that a little clip of the hands as they go number one slot well, I'm just looking here at CSC. They look as good as Discovery Channel today. I have to say, Paul, this is going to go right down to the line. T-Mobile have done their job at every check so far. They certainly have, and T-Mobile have got the best time with six kilometres to go. 20 seconds faster than Liberty Seguros and 51 seconds faster than Team Phonak. 
Phil Acton, who really we thought would have been a top three team on the day, should get in top three team at the moment, but they will slip away as the teams Discovery and CSC come to the line. Here they come, though. Floyd Landis, his face twisted in pain, hits the line. Third best so far for Phil Acton. They've lost their first man here. This could be a sign. This is Giovanni Lombardi. He is the team sprinter, so not surprisingly, he's the first man to get popped off the back here of Team CSC. But over the final few kilometres, a man down can be a serious handicap. Now, will they be all smiles like we've seen the past two years? There is Lance, there's the time to 56.86 kilometres an hour by T-Mobile, and this is going to be even quicker than that. Lance is going to lead this Tour de France into retirement, having led his team to the fastest ever time trial in the history of the event. Here they come now, driving up to the line. Wait for the smiles, what determination. 110.4, 57.31 kilometres an hour. And at the six to go side, Team CSC still had a two second two advantage seconds, on two Discovery seconds. Saddles. That's the difference with Lance Armstrong and his uh, fellow countryman Dave Zabriskie. How ironic is that? Because if it were to finish right now, he would have doubled his lead. Now, I just see there, Phil, the sign which says two kilometres to go. Team CSC have got to get to the finish in two minutes. Two minutes, they have to ride right now at 60 kilometres an hour. And with the corners, I don't think that's possible. Well, Paul, look, number 21 is the leader of the team in the weeks ahead. That's Ivan Basso. It looks to me as though he's sitting at the back now. He's not so sure he can drive this group anymore. But the boy in yellow, Zabriskie, is itching to get through. He's such a strong man. This is very difficult through here now as we go through the S's and they approach the line. Remember, two seconds is the margin. Two seconds is the margin. Oh, oh and the yellow jersey's gone. down. What has happened? He's overshot the bend. Total disaster. The yellow jersey has hit the bend. Well, that is it. That is it because he is no longer with the team. His teammate just behind him managed to get around him, but Dave Zabriskie has gone down very hard. He will not now be able to finish with the team. He will not get the same time as the team. So win or lose by Team CSC, he has lost oh. the yellow jersey with that horrible crash at one and a half kilometers to go. And it was heavy. Look at his shorts, his jersey, the Mayo Zorn is solid. There's no one kilometer rule in a time trial. He will lose the time it's a long way up this home straight at 11039 they drive on now team csc heading up towards the line 39 is the time of team discovery channel it's still a little way to go they may be just outside it they've got 10 seconds to get up this straight it is a long way it is a vicious spin but i think they'll be the wrong side of 39 anyway but it doesn't matter because the yellow jersey has passed the lance armstrong they hit the line the two second margin can continues to haunt them 110 41 it's the wrong way anyway he would have lost it but now he is going to slip out of the top 10 probably phil that is the most unbelievable team time trial i think i have ever witnessed in my life so poor david zabriski the consolation if there is one he would have lost his lead anyway but what we would have had was lance armstrong and zabriski equal first in the tour de france how incredible Incredible is that. As it is, it doesn't matter because he's coming home in his own time, losing time, and that welt on the side of his thigh is beginning to look rather ugly. Dave Zabriskie, don't feel ashamed because you almost did it. But at this time, I'm afraid the master has played the master stroke. Armstrong is back in the maillot jaune of the Tour de France. After the slow, painful ride to the finish, David Zabriskie had the slow, painful one past the press to his team car. The stage result would have done nothing to improve his mood. Even with the crash, CSC lost only two seconds to discovery. If anyone but Zabriskie had gone down, that would have been enough to hold on to the race lead. T-Mobile make up the top three on the stage. But it's Armstrong's squad that gets on the podium for the third year running, twice as US Postal, once as discovery. And as usual, the team time trial produces wholesale changes at the top. Four Discovery riders in the top six, including Armstrong, now installed as race leader. Alexander Vinokurov is seventh, David Zabriskie down to ninth on the same time as his leader Ivan Basso, with Jan Ulrich 14th. Well, we said he knew the impact a crash could have on the team time trial. 
but Lance surely didn't think before the stage that it would take one to put him into the race lead. The yellow jersey, close though, two seconds. Close, I know. I know. We were, we were, we were trying to watch the, the, the race in the, in the bus. Our TV was in and out, and we were just everybody on pins and needles looking at the, at the clock. And uh, we knew it was going to be close because the, the wind was uh, so favorable today that uh, difficult to make a selection, difficult to, to get big time differences. And uh, CSC was strong, you know, so tough to, tough to beat them. Tough for David Dabriskie, too, to crash in the yellow jersey is bad enough to do it within 1,300 metres of the finish after a storming Team time trial ride must double the misery. And Zabriskie seemed no wiser than anyone else as to what caused it. I don't know what happened. Maybe the chain slipped off or it just happened so fast and I can't see a good angle on TV. It just uh, one second happened. Well, his manager doesn't know. He doesn't seem to know himself. Chris Boardman, I mean, the shot's not very good, is it, from behind? But what do you make of Dave Zabriskie's crash? I think after we'd seen it a couple of times, it was good enough. There was basically two things that could have happened. He's either pulled his foot out or his chains come off, because we could see he had all his weight on the crank and suddenly lost any kind of resistance, and he just went straight down. And you know what it's like to crash out in the yellow jersey. You've crashed out of the whole race. He's just crashed out of the race lead, but it, still, he must be feeling pretty bad. Oh, to get so close, literally, it, within sight of the finish line, to have it all snatched away, it's going to probably take a couple of days for him to get over that. Now, today the race is back in its normal configuration for Stage 5, which most likely means a bunch sprint at the finish. Tom Burnham is looking for his third win out of three. Robbie McEwen is just looking for sympathy. What we can say is that Stage 5, 183 kilometres from Chambord to Montargis, is flat and tailor-made for Robbie to try to make his point on the road, where he's a bit more persuasive. We pick it up heading into Montargis, and it's looking like a bunch finish. They're absolutely flying through here. We're gently downhill, but they're safe at the moment. Now, anybody who doesn't want to get involved better get out of this one because we're heading into the narrow streets. There's a cobble section as we head up to the kite. There's the kite. One kilometre to go. Matty White has swung off. There he is on the right-hand side. Job done for the day. He's looking to see whether Stewie O'Grady is going to come up with the goods. It's Bradley McGee on the front. This is what he wants to do. Cookies up there into third place, but so too is the green jersey. And there is Tor Hussoff, the Credi Agricole rider over on the left hand side still Phil I cannot see Robbie McEwen this is the corner we're talking about and they made it safely much to my amazement they have turned up now it's an uphill finish and Baden Cook has got himself right in the place here Armstrong safe in that back watch out for the third wheel the third man in white Baden Cook is now second here comes the lead out for Tom Bolan why Cookie hasn't got it Bolan is tucked over to our left and he's got the man on his wheel there from Australia uh, McEwen is behind this is still the lead out but it's going to be now for Isa but here comes the lead out for, for Bonan, Bonan goes but Kewen chases him down and now the green jersey again has hit the front, O'Grady is out of it, here comes McEwen, he's got the legs this time, Robbie McEwen is forced to the line and takes it that's revenge for you <laughs> look at that salute by Robbie McEwen, that was not to the crowd that was to the referees to say guys I can win these sprints, that was great revenge for Robbie McEwen after being relegated from third place in their stage into tours and what a sprint by Robbie McEwen we did say Phil before the start that he would enjoy that little corner at 500 meters to go this is when weight perhaps isn't so much but it was uphill but this smart guy can guide himself through a minefield and he's done that look at the face behind on Stuart O'Grady as well boy McEwen does send them at us sometimes and this is one of his best yes we know Robbie it was pretty good wasn't it I think he's enjoyed that. Hello, thank you very much. This goes to prove that I am one of the top sprinters on the block, but let's look at it from the air. Well, just having a quick look at there, Tom Boonen has got a nice clear shot at the finish line, but this is the kind of sprint which is slightly uphill. You have to wait right down to the last possible moment. Boonen looked as if he had the power, but Robbie McEwen has got the kick. McEwen just wanted to get this victory. Boonen gets himself second, and Hushoff gets himself third. Place. What was the celebration all about? Uh, it was a bit of a double celebration, just to say I'm the fastest one here today and um, my team is the one that did all the work to provide me with this opportunity. Vindication for Robbie McEwen as he does Tom Bonin out of a hat-trick, Tor Hushoff taking third place for the second time in three bunch sprints.
Now, Robbie says stage wins are all he's interested in from here on. And as you can see, even this stage win leaves him no higher than fourth in the green jersey competition. In the overall standings, the result changes nothing. Lance Armstrong still leads, and Manira's non-teammate is Jens Voigt of CSC, one minute, four seconds back. The closest T-Mobile man is Alexander Vinokurov in seventh. Dave Zabriskie nursing his road rash through the stages ninth, just ahead of his team leader, Ivan Basso, and Jan Ulrich remains 14th. <laughs> Hello, stage six brings the tour to Nancy and the fabulous Stanislas Square, built for the last Duke of Lorraine in 1760 and long since designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Now, today's stage actually marks the tour's centenary visit. It's been coming here since the third edition of the race in 1905, and Nancy has been associated with winners pretty much from the start. There's the route in front of the riders today, 199 kilometres from Trois to Nancy, three bonus sprints along the way, and four fourth category climbs, the lowest designation a hill can have in the tour and still count. The beautiful old French towns and high-speed fun sprints aren't necessarily a happy combination, especially in the rain. And the final corner of the run-in came with a warning in the riders' road book. Well, this stage six finish in Nancy is definitely shaping up like it's probably going to be yet another sprint. And like those other sprints, it finishes with a few tricky corners. Possibly not too dramatic unless that long-awaited rain actually does materialise. This is one of the two main obstacles that I can see. Just under two kilometres to go, the riders are going to come round this corner. It's really going to string out the peloton before they plunge down 300 metres to the Flamme Rouge. Well, even though they've just come underneath it, most of the riders are going to be heavily on the brakes by now. And here's the reason why. A sharp right-hand bend with just over 900 metres still to go. You might be able to pick out the adverse camber and the white lines, and that's what's going to make it a little bit more hazardous if it rains. Once through here, it's more or less a straight 900-metre dash all the way to the line. Perhaps ironically, considering that we're talking about final kilometre mayhem and after David Zabriskie's crash, this has actually been one of the safest Tour de France first weeks in recent history. And that's no coincidence. After Laurent Jalabert's clash at the finish line in Armentier, one I narrowly missed myself, the Society de Tour de France has taken steps to make the finishes as safe as possible. And nowhere is it more evident than here in the final few hundred metres. As you can see, these are custom-made barriers. There's no feet for the riders to come into contact with. They even slope away from the peloton. The Society de Tour de France has even made sure there's a little place for the local gendarme to take his pictures in perfect safety. As we join the action, local boy Christophe Mongin is on the verge of the Tour's first successful solo breakaway, powering into Nancy, with the pack piling it on to try to pull him in. He is going to come up now to the last couple of kilometres, and he's going to still hold a very, very slight lead. These long kilometres right now will not be good for Christophe Mongin because the main field will be able to judge the distance they are behind him. But it seems as if there is no organisation now by the sprinters. It's all over. This is Alexander Vinokurov is going for now it. That's a crafty little move by a man who could win the Tour de France. He's tied alive in it all up here for the T-Mobile squad. Remember, they're going home in the next couple of days. They're a German-sponsored team at 1.3 miles to go. We are now at two kilometres from the finish. Vinokurov has taken it up. And he's still got 10 seconds lead. You can see the darkness in the back there. That is the main field. They're charging through the streets of Nancy. They're less than 50 metres. And Alexander Vinokurov, Phil, is getting himself halfway across the gap. I'm not sure who he's trying to lead out for T-Mobile. But there, it is in, he's got the gap. He's got the gap over the front end of the main field. Clever rider. Oh, well, he, this is a, such a typical move by Vinokurov. Looking from the helicopter now, the first picture there we can see. He's going to hit the kilometre, probably ahead, and then Vinokurov is going to join in. There's more help on the way. The peloton have not got a hold of this race yet. I hope he doesn't hesitate like he did on the final stage of Paris. As soon as he catches Mongin, he has to go straight over the top. Otherwise, he's going to get caught up by the acceleration of the sprinters. Well, somewhere above us, we will see one kilometre to go. Christophe Mangin has seen the two riders catch him now. He will have to take a deep breath and try and work with them. There's the kilometre kite. There are now three riders. What a dramatic finish this is. Oh, and, oh, and he's, he's gone. He's overshot. Vinokurov skids and misses him. There's another crash, a massive pile up on that bend. And that is going to give the victory to the breakaway. They just lost their concentration here. But it looks as though Armstrong again on the late crash has gone through on the inside with all the skills I'm trying to nail this rider Paul but it looks like a rider is it from Fasa Bortolo it is it's not Fabian Cancellara 
I don't think, but it's a big rider. It could be Kim Kirk and this of Luxembourg is clear. We pull back from the shadows of the arch on Stanislav Square. And now the rate there, and there is Robbie McEwen. He's down. Uh, picking up the bits and there is the fall and Christophe Monjam. what the way to end the day here as uh, we need to cut back to the beginning here he looks okay a little bit stunned Gerard Port the doctor is there as well this rider whoever he is is about to win at the stage Vinokurov skidded missed the crash and it's coming again the champion of Kazakhstan and the legs on that big man I've got a feeling it might be Kim Kirken that's who we're going for he has got the victory on the line. It's not Kim Kirken, but he's got the victory on the line. And Vinokurov gets a second. And the rider who's won is Lorenzo Bernucci of Italy. Well, that was an unbelievably timed move by Bernucci coming across there. It really was an incredible move as well. There is Lance Armstrong, but I think, Phil, if we look back at the results, the referees will give everybody there the same time. Armstrong in that group, not showing any emotion at all on his face. That crash was well inside the last kilometre of racing, well inside the last three kilometres of racing. So I feel sure that the judges will give everybody here the same time. Right, let's have a look at the stage result. Lorenzo Bernucci takes his first ever win in the Tour de France, just ahead of Alexander Vinokurov. But more interesting is the gap from Vinokurov back to the rest of the field. Seven seconds on his team leader, Jan Ulrich, who came in 19th. Lance Armstrong was 32nd, and even Basso 75th. Add in the 12 second time bonus, Vinokurov picked up for second place, and he took 19 seconds off the other big names. The more immediate glory, though, to Bonucci. 25 years old, in second place in a stage of the Tour of Switzerland, his best result prior to this one. And here's an insight into the priorities of your average rider. With men on the ground all around him, no sooner has Bonucci's fellow Fassa Bortolo rider, Fabian Cancellara, steadied himself at the back of the crash, and he's on the radio shouting encouragement to his colleague up the home straight. The man who started the pile-up, Christophe Monjan, eventually rolled in 128th with nothing to show for his efforts except the beginnings of a beautiful black eye. With all due kudos to Lorenzo Bonucci, the big news of the stage was its effect on the overall standings. And Vinokurov's sheer nerve has moved him up into third, just behind George Hincapie. A minute and two seconds behind Armstrong, instead of the one minute 21 he was before the stage. Jan Ulrich finished in a group ahead of Armstrong, but because the split was caused by a crash inside the last three kilometers, he got the same time, so his deficit doesn't change. Still comfortably in yellow than Armstrong, but perhaps a bit less comfortable than he was at the start of the day, because Vinokurov's unpredictability is the one thing that Discovery's meticulous team machine can't factor into its calculations. Do you think he's the main man at T-Mobile now? Because Jan Ulrich was saying before the tour, you're never going to know who's the captain. Nah. Is that important? I mean, we have to ride our race, you know? And, uh, I, 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 not to... Not to, to sound like a snob, but I mean, we have to, we, we had to prepare ourselves to get here and, and, and now we have a strategy and we have a great team behind us and we're going to ride our race and, and ultimately if, if, you know, the secret leader comes along from another team and beats us, then we lose, but okay. I think right now we're, we're happy with what we have. Stage seven takes the tour into Germany, and a German rider had the distinction of being first across the border, Fabian Wegmann of Gerolsteiner. But he was swept up long before the finishing Karlsruhe, and as we join the race, the whole field is together. In two lines now, Licky Gas over on the left-hand side. You could see Francis de Jeu were losing the line, so they're smoothing across into the middle of the road. Still, Bradley McGee is waiting for the last moment. He's the kind of rider who's got a great leader. But look at Boonen right up there, moving up through the middle onto the tail there of Jan Kersipu in the black, blue and white jersey. The champion of Estonia has got Tor Hushoff right on his wheel. Boonen rides at this minute in 12th position in this pack from the helicopter. The Leaky Gas boys still feel the confidence in Pagliarini because they've got to control the front of the bunch. Toe two for Tor Hushoff here. Off to the left is Bradley McGee now and locked on his wheel is Baden Cook. That's the big Australian double. That's McGee in the white. McCook is behind him at second and third to those boys. This is going to be one terrific rush for the line. Robert Foster's trying to get in for Gerald Steiner now. Tor Hushoff is moving up as they start to fan across the road. They're looking for one kilometre to go. They're still looking. In fact, they've come inside. There's oh, 500, 500 metres to go. To go.
and we've gone bowling past the one kilometer sign. McGee has got Cookie on his wheel, but there's a big launch coming from Kersey Poo in the middle and Tor Hushoff. Yes, that is Hushoff on the right there, but he's checked himself, and this is a brilliant lead out by Bradley McGee. McGee has now got Baden Cook. He launches Cook at the finishing line as Cook now makes the run for the line. On the rails there, there's been a crash, and in fact, Pearl has gone on the left. And look at McEwen on the inside. Magnus Backstead's got his wheel. Here comes Magnus Backstead to the line now. I think McEwen's held him off. McEwen on the line thinks he's got it, that for sure. The big surprise there. Absolutely no sign in the top five of Tom Bone, and he was out of that today. But there was a nasty crash there. I know Furlan was involved, but there was two riders went, and that's they come through here. Well, Robbie McEwen didn't cause that. There's the crash. That is Galvez, in fact, uh, being treated by Gerard Port. He looks totally disgusted, laying the bike down, walking away. Looks quite cool, actually. And this is the other bike. And look at this. Ferla is not happy, blaming Galvez. Galvez doesn't want to know about it. Let's have a look at the sprint. Look at this now. And there's no doubt about it. McEwen has got it. But that is a great sprint by Magnus Baxted. Big Maggie is back in the big time with that sprint finish. There's no doubt out of that. There's confirmation of the result, and it needs confirming on this stage because that was not an easy sprint to follow. Robbie McEwen took it though ahead of Liquid Gas Bianchi's Magnus Backstedt and Bernhard Eisel of Francaise de Jure. Behind the main action, the Commissaires were examining the replays of that crash in the home straight though, and so was Chris Borkman. Well, he circled Alan Davis for you here. You can see he's desperately trying to find a way out. He moves right and I think inadvertently takes out Galvis and Furlan. Well, the judges didn't agree. They decided it was out of order and relegated him to 173rd position. Bonin 2, McEwen 2, all square in stage victories between Belgium and Australia. So at the end of seven stages, Lance Armstrong will be carrying the yellow jersey up the first climb of the tour worth the name. <laughs> Now, as you know, before the race, all 189 riders have to undergo medical checks, and when they emerge one by one from the doctor's room, we will look in there like exit pollsters on election night to ask them one simple question. Who did they think was going to win the tour? Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Armstrong. Lance Armstrong will win the 2005 tour. Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Yeah, I won't lie, Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Lance Armstrong. Armstrong. How could you not pick him to win it? Jan Ulrich. Interesting. About the only major rider loyally picking Jan Ulrich is the man who currently looks best placed to overtake him as Lance Armstrong's major rival. Alexander Vinokurov rode a better opening time trial than his team leader. He's closer to Armstrong in the overall standings, and so far, he's the only man to have attacked him. It's all starting to look a bit reminiscent of 2003, the last time Vino rode the tour, and the last time that Armstrong was put under serious pressure. <laughs> Just look at this now, this is such a typical move by Alexander Vinokurov and he's free to fly. Vinokurov coming up the home straight, it's been another great battle, another late attack and he's got time back on Armstrong, he's winning. Here he goes again, Vinokurov just will not lay down today. And the man from Kazakhstan, well he really does bring the Tour de France to light, he's at it again. Here he goes, go get him, Alex. You know, I think the one man Armstrong really fears has been the Kurov, and there he is, right in his slipstream. Back at the start in Portsheim this morning, the first significant news was that Christophe Montjean, who crashed within sight of victory two days ago in Nancy, didn't start. He cracked a bone between his eyes in that crash. And a couple of other riders climbed off early in the day. Sylvain Calzati of Age Desert and one of yesterday's crash victims, Isaac Galvez of Villas Baleares. Now, the first escape of the day was by Michael Rasmussen of Rabobank. He led over all four of the early climbs before being caught by the peloton, and that was enough to give him the lead in the King of the Mountains competition as things stand. At the other end of the race, Tom Burnham, the leader in the sprinter's green jersey competition, was struggling in a small group the best part of four minutes behind the main field. And once he heard that on race radio, Tor Hushoff, who started the day second to Burnham, set off in search of points. He picked up six for being first man through the intermediate sprint at 125 kilometers. Behind him, rolling along in the bunch, the race leader was happy to engage the motorbike cameraman in a mixture of French and English conversation. <laughs> Okay. Wow. 
Now today's route bears more than a passing resemblance to one into Gap back in 2003 when Vinokurov attacked over the last summit and flew down the descent, picking up almost a minute off Armstrong in the process. As you can see, the last climb today is 15 kilometres from the finish here in Gerard May, and Ned Bolting's on it. I'll tell you what, it's a proper climb, this one. It's down in the route book as a Category 2, but having just driven up it, there's more than the whiff of Category 1 about it. 16.8 kilometres long and an average percentage gradient of 4.4. I reckon after a long week in the saddle, the peloton are going to struggle up here and we may see quite a lot of riders getting dropped. 20 kilometres to go to the finish line and Rabobank's Peter Veening out in front on his own, just 5k from the summit of the final climb. So the lone leader now, and he is completely on his own at the front end of this bike race as we look down at the three chasers, Juan Antonio Fletcher, Nicky Sorensen at the back there, Salvatore Comesso in the middle, and they are actually losing ground on the lone leader, the young man from Holland, Peter Wienen. Peter Wienen has ridden for the development squad of Team Rabobank since 2002, but he's been a member of the fully-fledged team since 2004. As we look here at the leaders, well, these are coming out of the front of the group here. Vinokurov, the little terror, is in third place. He is looking for the move now. This could be where he is planning an attack. And look at Lance. Lance Armstrong is not going to let him out of his sight this time. Vinokurov, the acceleration has forced Armstrong to come out and play. Well, that's Salvadelli trying to nail down the gap. Armstrong not panicking, but Vinokurov, true to his word, he really is the dark invader, well, isn't he? He's looking to try and see if there's any weakness in Armstrong's armour. What a super bike rider he's always taking the race to himself and haunting him just behind there is also Jan Ulrich here comes an attack now from Christoph Morrow they may not chase him with such enthusiasm well they're not too worried about Christoph Morrow as he goes inside of the 20 kilometer to go banner because he's a man who now another move here by Alexander Vinokurov he's going again just what he wants somebody else to draw the sting and he's gone and this time no forget it this time Lance has reacted like last time this time it's Armstrong himself in person chasing everybody down and look at that they've called the group of three riders who are halfway across the gap and I tell you what it looks as if there's a little bit of daylight there in between Alexander Vinokurov and Lance Armstrong he's taking his time to pull this one back but well, one Antonio Fletcher has had the legs to try and join in there's he's jumped onto the back the others have gone off uh, but Christoph Moreau joined by Alexander Vinokurov what a great bike racer he really is he's not going to take defeat lying down at all Armstrong is very very wise there he may have lost 19 seconds on the road to Nancy but he's going to mark that boy now yeah but big Jan is there as well he's right on the tail of Lance Armstrong you can just see the pink jersey moving up he's being very attentive and there's a rider moving in there from Il Balearis I think that is Mancebo one, two, three to Armstrong, four to Ulrich. Ulrich knows these climbs, he trains in them, or has trained in them during his maturity years, a top bike rider, he's not living too far away. Armstrong, it's already looking like a very select little group, this, and all of the hard work by Il Balearis, that'll be Valverde, who is in fourth wheel. They really have scattered this field. There's a couple of riders from Team Fonac now trying to come and scramble across the gap. Well, it's great to see Alejandro Valverde covering these moves, and that is why Il Balearis was so aggressive. He's going. He's a good bike rider, Alejandro Valverde. He's three and a half minutes down in the overall classification. I'm sure they won't chase him down. Well, they certainly have shut off. Lance certainly hasn't chased him down because Lance wants to keep uh, the two uh, uh, riders there. But look at uh, Vinokurov, gone again, and immediately Armstrong forced to react. He was watching there, uh, Jan Ulrich and Vinokurov, saying, well, boys, you're doing the riding today. I'm doing the following. Which one of you is going next? Here comes Vino, straight over the top of Valverde. This is Alessandro Valverde's first Tour de France. He must think they do this every time they come to this race. He's on a fast learning curve here at the Tour de France, Phil. He's uh, come here for the first time. I was amazed when he won a race in Paris-Nice at the start of the season. It was the first time he'd actually won a race outside of Spain or Portugal. But he certainly has. There's Cadell Evans moving up there as well. Now this is another move. Now this is Andreas Cloden. Who would have believed that? Well, I certainly wouldn't have believed it because he was riding so badly in the Dauphiné Libre. And this has got to be a tentative. I can't believe his form has become 
from nothing to absolutely magnificent in 12 days but at the moment Cloden has found his legs and up comes the reaction and the rider from Rabobank there is Dennis Menchoff who's gone forward as well well Cloden a fair way down in the overall standings almost two and a half minutes behind Lance Armstrong he started the day in 24 we talked about the triptych the trio of Basso. riders who could attack and Armstrong now being attacked by Basso everybody seems to want to go up the road Basso has gone Armstrong is watching them spin around he's still sitting by Jan Ulrich not sure he's getting such a good idea now Ulrich is gonna to have to catch up as well this is an amazing showdown I never expected this on the climb today you know this is the only way they're going to beat Lance Armstrong to launch attack after attack just keep going but he's actually pretty cool here he said right big Jan wants to win this Tour de France as well I'll just sit on his wheel and see where he's going to go well Lance has got about a dozen riders in front of him here and he's watching every one of the moves Santiago Botero is just hooked up in the back there as they're all getting back into this Michael Rasmussen the new leader in the King of the Mountains is tagged on the back as well could even score points on this climb and Andreas Claude, remember, as far as I know, we haven't passed Peter Weening yet. He is still ahead on the road. The camera's watching the action here. I can't believe that Weening, we've got no time check on him. He's Savar, ah, there he is. He's still ahead, but he's got to be caught shortly because Ooh. there's a flurry of attacks behind. He must be close. The lead car has gone by and must be right yep. behind. But, Phil, you look at his pedalling style here when he's rocking the top half of his body like that. That's an indication there's not that much power left. He is really suffering. Look at the difference in his style to the style here of Andreas Cloden, who I cannot believe is coming to form at the right time. And look at the gap that he's got over the group behind. He starts the day two and a half minutes down on Lance Armstrong. These three riders from T-Mobile are going to attack from now all the way to Paris to beat Armstrong. Well, this has to be a surprise. I'm not sure Lance will have written this one into his calculations, in all honesty, because Cloden hasn't looked to be going well. He must have done a lot of work for the last 10 days before the Tour de France. 25 seconds is the difference now between Cloden and Peter Weening. Weening must be in the last three kilometres of the climb, and Lance is still deciding to mark just the attacks of Vinokurov and Ulrich if he goes. Well, he knows when it comes down to the time trial down towards the end, he's got a big advantage over riders like Andreas Cloden. He can give this man a minute or so when we go into the final time trial and still beat him. There's a slight reorganization here as we look at the group behind. They're starting to reform, but T-Mobile came out today with a plan. They wanted to launch the attack. The man who set it all up is just about halfway down there in the turquoise jersey, the champion of Kazakhstan, Alexander Vinokurov. But I tell you what, nobody, I don't think anybody in this field expected a move to come from Andreas Cloden. I'm absolutely certain they didn't. Here he is, he's still looking quite frisky as well. He's still going to pick up the leader, of course, Peter Weening, as we come towards the top of the Col de la Schlucht. Then it is going to be a very, very difficult descent now because these boys are going to turn the pressure on going downhill. Andreas Cloden, who finished so far behind, you needed binoculars uh, in the Dauphiné on Mont Blanc 2, all of a sudden is off the front in the Tour de France. Unbelievable. He looked like a sack of potatoes in the <laughs> Dauphiné Libre. He rode like a sack of potatoes, but right now, I think he's peeling off the front. Well, there's a huge crowd come out to this mountain, as you can see here, and they've been waiting to see the main peloton. They've cheered a man they probably didn't recognise. Here is Peter Weening making a little name for himself today in the Tour de France. I am wondering if he was meant to soften the riders up before their new signing, Denis Menchov, because Rabobank have never been a team to race for the final yellow jersey before, but they've got in Menchov a possible winner if things go his way, and he's in that group now, which we'll call the Armstrong group. Here it is. Will Balear is still thinking about the victory, but this is quite a big group now. We're one kilometre from the summit of the climb, and we will be then faced up with a 10-mile descent down to the finishing town of Gerard Mer. And just look at this man, he's going to get the points at the top, the double points, 20 for the winner today, not sure that figures with the overall, but good for him, as he rocks and rolls his way up with 10 miles to go, or 16 kilometres. This is a big moment in this rider's young life, probably a big moment in that chap's young life too. 
as we now look at Cloden, second on the mountain, heading up towards the summit. And he looks good. His pedalling style is smooth. He looks comfortable on the machine. All he's going to face himself up to now is a very rapid descent. A bit of confusion at the front there. All the motorbikes want to get the first shot they've had of this man there so far this season because he's never really been at the front end of the main field anywhere apart from a stage of the Bayern Munich Rundfahrt. Look at this man. He's tongue locked in the right-hand side of his mouth there. Concentrating. Eyes just staring at the summit and being giving himself a feeling they are drawing me in as we go underneath this little uh, overhang here and as that group is funnily enough is getting bigger rather than smaller right now so they may have slowed down a bit this will be good for the leader if they've slowed down Phil it's only a fraction because look how long that group is the pressure is really on the attacks are coming again thick and fast it really is a lot of pressure we can see here the man just coming out of the back of the group Juan Antonio Fletcher not really a surprise he was in the breakaway nearly all day he's paying for the price but he's nearly at the summit he may descend quite well and Cloden has gone he's going to try and outspeed him he's gonna he didn't know he was coming and he's gonna really kick himself for that because look at that 10 meters in the line Cloden is over first and Cloden is gonna be the polka dot jersey leader of the king of the mountains classification tonight with 20 points and Rasmussen I don't think will be too happy about that no because he would have thought he'd done enough today and it's all swung around well I can't believe that the man who was second in last year's Tour de France show no form at all this year is now the next man in the polka dot jersey and looking rather good just now the two riders over the top together now it's a full ball down to Gerard Mer well the attacks petered out after Cloden left the Armstrong group behind to chase down Veining and as the pair of them approach the one kilometre banner it looks like Germany against the Netherlands for the stage win well, this is a skillful tactic by the rider from Holland. He's learnt an awful lot in just a week in his first Tour de France. He stopped working with the leader. He's going to just wait and take the risk of them catching up. Cloden is racing for time. He's thinking of the future in the Tour de France. Wienen is thinking of about 800 metres in the Tour de France. And that will be his first ever stage win. And I'll take my hat off to Cloden. He's not made any effort to force the other rider through. No, he knows that what he's got to do is ride for time. It's so important for him this afternoon. He's going to move himself up. It's 30 seconds back They've to the main it. group. It. So it's one of these two riders is going to win the stage. They've got it. Now, Wienen has is obviously going to come out of the slipstream he'll be the fresher of the two he made the move right at the base of the Col de la Schlucht and he stayed away until Cloden stole the prize off him 10 metres from the top and now he's forced the German rider to open up the sprint he's going to have to wait oh has he got it look at the look in his eye he's got this he'll move round him at the very last minute which side is he going to go now here he comes his first ever victory in his first ever oh did he get it Paul I don't know well that's a Photo film. That is a photo side by side. Those riders were as they came across the line, and I don't think either of them knew who got the win. Jörg Jansk on the far right of our picture here. Cadell Evans on the far left in the red jersey. Vina Kulov is looking for the tie bonus. There's a third place tie bonus at stake as he starts to come out and attack. Here, Christoph Bolo comes on the right, Valverde, and also Jens Voigt, and he's been washed away. Vina Kulov. I think it's going to be Valverde who gets third on the line and a very small time bonus. Well, the judges on the line did eventually confirm Peter Veining as the winner, but looking at the photo, it's not entirely clear how Ned Bolting went in search of clarification. Here is the equipment that determined who was the winner, and this is the man who operated the equipment. Bruno, how did you work out who won that stage? OK, just let me show you on the screen. OK, so you just have to zoom in between the two riders. So here's the first wheel. And That's Veining's wheel? Yeah, sure. And you can see there is one pixel between the two riders. So there is less than one thousand of seconds between the two riders. And there it is spelled out. Peter Veining gets his first ever tour win ahead of Andreas Cloden. A pair of them finishing 27 seconds ahead of the chasing bunch, led in by Alejandro Valverde, with Jens Voigt fifth and Jan Ulrich sixth. Behind them, Vinokurov, Armstrong and Basso were all in the same group of 31 riders. None of the big names, of course, was interested in chasing Peter Veining, but kudos to him nonetheless for getting in the right break and having the legs to ride away from it. Peter, your first professional win, your first Tour de France. What sort of a feeling is that? Yeah, it's a really uh, special feeling, uh, of course. Uh, yeah, I was fighting the whole day for it and, uh, and, I, and I win it. It's unbelievable. 
Now, the big question of stage eight is where were Lance Armstrong's teammates? And if you're him, the answer's not very encouraging. The top place discovery rider was the youngest, Yaroslav Popovic, in a group that lost one minute 25. He was alongside Jose Acevedo and George Hincapi. The other five, including the winner of this year's Giro d'Italia, Paolo Savaldelli, lost nearly three minutes on what was barely a warm-up for the real mountains. Well, he looked happy enough on the podium, but I suspect the smile will last as long as it takes him to escape the last camera and get on the team bus to start the inquest. Because although the time gaps are mostly unchanged, the top of the overall standings suddenly looks much more like a real race and less like a lap of honour for him. There are three CSC riders in the top six, Jens Voigt, Bobby Julik and Ivan Basso. And there are two team mobiles, Vinokurov, who remains third, and Jan Ulrich, who's up to sixth. Behind them, Andreas Klerden, who had a disastrous opening time trial, has ridden himself into the top ten and confirmed that Team Mobile have a third weapon to employ against the defending champion. What's wrong with the team? That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, uh, perhaps we've uh, been a little too active in the race, worked a little too much. Maybe the guys are tired. I, I can't really comment without actually sitting down with them and saying, What's wrong with you? <laughs> How did you feel? I mean, was, what's the problem? Were, were you, was it your breathing? Was it your legs? Was it the rhythm? Was it the, the climb? It's a strange climb too, you know, to start, uh, I mean, it's a long climb, but not very steep. So you're able to keep 30, 40, 50 guys there and they can, they can take shots at you from the back and it's hard to follow those. Well, you have to take Lance Armstrong at his word, and uh, the word doesn't sound very encouraging as far as his support goes. No, he looked like a man who was rattled to me, for sure. That is not what you would want. He be completely isolated. At the top of a second category climb, too, I would say. I can see no tactical advantage of that, so not a good day for Lance. And there's the Stage 9 battleground, 171 kilometres from Gérard May de Moulouse, with six climbs, including the Grand Ballon and the Ballon d'Alsace. There was bad news for T-Mobile early in the stage when Jan Ulrich came off on the first descent and had to be paced back into the race by four teammates. But the news was even worse for David Zabriskie, the first yellow jersey wearer of this year's race, finally succumbing to the injuries he sustained in that crash during the team time trial on Stage 4. Rabobank's Danish rider Michael Rasmussen, who started the stage in the King of the Mountains jersey, attacked almost from the flag and took all six summits with little or no company. Behind him, Jens Voigt, a minute behind Armstrong, remember, in second place at the start of the stage, set off on an attack of his own and was joined by Christophe Moreau. At the front of the main field, the Discovery Outriders were back in formation. The show of strength was largely ceremonial, as they showed no real interest in wasting undue energy on either Rasmussen or Voigt. So as we join the race, Rasmussen is homing in on a superb solo stage win. It has been an exhibition of terrific bike riding over all of the mountains of this region in first place. He won all the prizes along the route except one small prize. He gave that to the rider who dared to join him for a short distance and then he dispatched him back to the field. It's a little bit of a lonely ride, but he should start to feel good pretty now, uh, pretty much now, as this massive crowd in Malouz cheer him all the way home. It's a corridor of noise that this rider is going through, urging him up to the finishing line. They realise how brave this man has been here this afternoon. They realise what an effort he's had to put in to survive off the front on a very difficult day through the Vosges. For nearly four and a half hours, they've watched him on the television at the finishing line. Now they can see him in person as he salutes the crowd. He gets his first ever stage win. He could not have imagined that was the way it was going to be when he left around midday today from the town of Jarmer. Well, now we have to wait for Jens Voigt to come in with his, his compatriot for the afternoon, Christophe Moreau. And I've just cast my mind back and forgotten that for many, many years, Morrow and Voigt rode for the same pretty agricole team. We drive up to the finishing line now. I don't think Jens is going to even try to go by him as they come to the line. Christophe Morrow, the Frenchman, has certainly found his old form again. They used to be teammates, as Paul has said. They're now rivals, but I think today they're teammates again. As they come up to the line, three minutes has passed by on the clock, and Christophe Moreau takes second. Voigt is third. The clocks have started now. Let's wait for Armstrong.
the main field are being led home still by Discovery Channel. We mustn't forget that the winner of the stage is Michael Rasmussen. Second place on the stage going to Christophe Moreau. Third place going to Jens Voigt. And Jens Voigt, I think, right now has done just enough to be the new yellow jersey here at the Tour de France. Well, Voigt has done most things in his cycling career, but we love him. That was a great ride by Jens. Now he's got to wait. These are nervous moments, of course, to see just if he is the next Maillot Jaune of the Tour de France. This is the big lead out. This is David Montcoutier on the front, taking over the pacemaking now. It's Cedric Vasseur up into third place. Is Stuio Grady wants this four points for this place here. Is Gafour fourth place here at the end of the stage is going to move him very close to the top end of the green jersey race. He's there, looking over his shoulder. There are not very many top sprinters in this group. As Stuio O'Grady is lined up, it's still Cedric Vasseur all over the machine. O'Grady's waiting. There's a challenge coming from Leaky Gas up through the middle there, but O'Grady's still waiting. He's an experienced track rider when it comes down to sprinting at the end of a race like this and he wants to make sure he gets himself maximum points here's the explosion coming down the right hand side the Aussie's going for it O'Grady's trying to get himself fourth place on the stage it's going to be so important but Bradley McGee is challenging him on the line it's O'Grady just ahead of Bradley McGee but that is a great move up the points classification for Stewie O'Grady from Adelaide the only sprinter here this afternoon to get himself over the Ballon d'Alsace and at the back of that group there is Lance Armstrong Armstrong in the yellow jersey. There's the stage result. It's the result of Michael Rasmussen's life with Christophe Moreau, an exhausted but essentially meaningless second, and Jens Voigt, a superb third. Three minutes and four seconds between Rasmussen and those two, and another three minutes between them and the main group containing Lance Armstrong and the rest of the big names. Well, the 1999 World Cross Country mountain bike champion crossed some country today, pretty much the whole of the 171 kilometer stage on his own, and he's well in control of the King of the Mountains competition heading into the Alps. Suddenly leading the race, although not necessarily in control of it, is Jens Voigt. He has a lead of 1 minute 50 on Christophe Moreau and 2 minutes 18 on Lance Armstrong. Michael Rasmussen's heroics vault him up to fourth. Behind him, the time gaps between the contenders for overall victory are the same. Everyone has just been shunted down by that stage result. Well, if it hadn't been for David Zabriskie's crash in the team time trial, CSC might have had the race lead for the entire race so far. As it is, they started the tour with it, and Jens Voigt has reclaimed it for them just in time for the real fight to begin when the race hits the Alps. Jens Voigt, the yellow jersey, how does it feel? Oh, yeah, of course it's great. Uh, it's a dream coming true. And when we look at the next stages, today was my very, very last chance uh, to get it because I don't think I can attack on a Galibier or on Courcheval. So today was my very last chance and I'm really optimistic I can defend it tomorrow. Yep, unless Discovery raid Jens' his hotel room on the rest day, I think it's safe until tomorrow. And Tom Burnham's lead in the green jersey competition should last well beyond that. The sprinters race will go into hibernation now, while the sprinters themselves go into oxygen debt, hauling themselves over the climbs. And while we're rounding things up, the young rider competition is currently the closest of the lot. Vladimir Karpitz with just a one second lead over Discovery's debutante Yaroslav Popovic. Exterior day, slow dissolve off helicopter shots of stunning alpine scenery to the impassive yet determined face of our hero. And I don't mean me, when they come to shoot the Lance Armstrong movie there'll be no need to build a sound stage for the key racing scenes, the backdrop's already here. For the first real mountain stage of this year's tour, we're two kilometres above sea level up here at Courchevel, and all these main rivals know the script by heart. They might as well try to attack, because they know that if they don't, he will. A physical and mental delivery here by Lance Armstrong to all of his rivals in the Tour de France. He is just going faster, faster, faster. Lance Armstrong comes across the line, winner today of the mountain stage of the Tour de France. The Armstrong today has destroyed the field in the Tour de France. A shake of the head there by little Marco Pantani. He started it and Armstrong has finished it. This is where you have to race alone and Armstrong's gone. A big move by Lance this. He took a look straight into the eyes there of Jan Ulrich and said, well, here I go, are you coming or not? And the answer is not. 
Armstrong that wins the day, claims again another first on the first day in the mountains, and waiting for him, the Golden Fleece. He's the new leader of the tour. He's accelerating again, Phil. This is amazing. This man has been on the ground. He almost lost his manhood on that crossbars a few moments ago, and he's decided he wants to go. And here he goes, he's building up for a move. As he's not seen Ulrich, he's not seen any of them. He thinks, well, I may as well go and try what happens. Armstrong, yes, he had no choice, he had to win. So the first rest day of this year's Tour de France is now behind the riders. They awoke this morning in Grenoble. They could see the mountains all around them, I must say. Here at Courchevel, they've never looked better. I don't suppose all of the riders, though, will take the same view. Well, as we saw just before the rest day, Lance Armstrong and his team seem to be in, as we say, a spot of bother. Yeah, I don't think Lance Armstrong himself was under any difficulty at all. He controlled and did exactly what he had to do on the slopes of that final climb going down towards Gerard Mare. But the team, there was a big question mark. I think they were just caught out by the severity and the speed on that occasion. Maybe just a little bit too relaxed, but coming into the Alps, it's going to be a different story. Well, they did seem to make some amends on the road into Malouze, but the other rider, the rider who crashed, Jan Ulrich, we never saw that crash. It was off our cameras. In fact, he was blown off, apparently, by a gust of wind. He somersaulted a number of times. He was quite hurt and we don't yet know how he's going to react. Well there was even a question that he might not start the stage and I think the most important thing for Jan Ulrich is he will be sore for a few days. Any kind of crash like that it takes a number of days to get over it. I hope Jan Ulrich continues, I hope he perseveres because I think he's really the only man who can challenge Lance Armstrong strength for strength. Well Jan, Jens Voigt made us laugh the other day because after he took the yellow jersey he said the only day I will defend my lead is tomorrow. He was referring of course to yesterday's rest day when there was no racing. So today I have a feeling we won't see too much of him. Let's go back to the action. Well if you're going to attack Courchevel would be the place to do it. The final climb of a mountain top finish with no descent where your rivals can recover. Armstrong, though, rarely attacks before his heavies have softened up the opposition, and stage 10 followed the familiar pattern. Discovery, after their collective off day in the Vosges, set a pace that was shelling world-class riders off the back of the lead group, and as we join commentary on the climb up to Courchevel, Alexander Vinokurov is the latest of them. I wonder if this man here is playing a game, Phil. Vinokurov keeps looking down, he, he le keeps looking at his gears. He shouldn't really be sitting in this position, he should be sitting in this guy's fourth cracking. or fifth this position. This guy is cracking. He was the man that Armstrong thought was the biggest challenger that he could have in the Tour de France this year. Opening up the jerseys a sign, he's looking for that little bit more oxygen. He's losing the back wheel of this bus, and in fact, he's going to have to try and ride around Oscar Pereira. The gap is there. Armstrong will know this immediately, and so will Yaroslav Popovic. I'm sure they'll turn up the ratchet just a little All bit right. more. Who's the leader of T-Mobile now, Paul? Because this guy has cracked, and Ulrich is still there. And so is Andreas Cloden. The two German riders at the top end of T-Mobile have managed to stay in contact with Lance Armstrong. I'm amazed to see Alexander Vinokurov, but we said, Phil, it is always strange the day after a rest day. It's a horrible thing for a bike rider to have. People think, oh, great, they've had a rest, they've recuperated. The body does very strange things on the rest day. It's taken punishment for nine days, then all of a sudden you turn off the punishment. It thinks it's all over, and then well, you've got to do it the next day. Lance said at the start he would try and lift the pace and see if he could distance some of his rivals. And again, he predicted he would lose his jersey the other day. He did. He predicted he would distance some of his rivals today. He has done so. And he's still got Popovic, the signing of the year. The man who is expected to replace Armstrong as a tour winner next year right on the front and the others are having to hope and I'm sure that's all they do is they hope they can match the pace of this tandem well Popovic Armstrong coming up alongside he's Popovic there. Here. he's, he's having talking. a quick chat uh, you know exact in fact he's asked him to lift it a little bit more look at the acceleration now coming from Popovic they know that everybody's on the rivet Lance he, shouted at him then. he knows that Alexander Vinokurov is not there he said come on mate let's go let's give it to them well look at this now Cadell Evans uh, scrambling at the back but uh, strong enough to go forward on the wheel of Menchop there that's a good move and this is an incredible acceleration by Popovic now he's eased Armstrong's looking and this is going to be an attack by Armstrong watch out that's the discussion that's the lift up the place let's put these 
these guys into the red zone. I'm feeling good. I want to put the hammer down here this afternoon, and he has done. Armstrong now has taken Armstrong over. Armstrong is an angry man. You can see it. He never does this. He is sensed that he is in a position to turn them apart, and he's taking over. All right, guys, so you got rid of my team, did you? Now try and get rid of me. Well, look at this. Jan Ulrich, number 11. Look at that face. He's looking up the road to see what he can see in front of him, and what he can see disappearing is a certain man by the name of Lance Armstrong. There's two riders with Armstrong, though, from Illes Baleares, Alejandro Valverde and Francisco Mancebo. Well, this is going to be an amazing last couple of kilometres. Meanwhile, he thought he was going to be in yellow, Christophe Moreau. He might still be third or fourth when he gets to the top now. Armstrong has made it quite apparent. The yellow jersey is on its return trip to his camp. Alejandro Valverde slipping to the back of the group. This is his first attempt at the Tour de France. He is a man, as far as I'm concerned, for the future. Armstrong looking to see who's on his shoulder. Ivan Basso. Armstrong needs to gain 2 minutes and 18 seconds today if he wants to get the yellow jersey, and that is on Jens Voigt. Well, that's already job done. He needs 28 seconds on Christophe Moreau. Well, that's already job done. He's currently yellow jersey on the road. And Mansebo's just been unhooked at the back as well. He's going to come down. Here we have uh, just the up there is Jan Ulrich and Andrew Keshekin. They are going back now. Remember, too, first three riders to finish get small time bonuses 20 for the win, 12 and 8. And now it looks as though Floyd Landis also has cracked. Phil, there's a big difference between being a team helper and being a team leader, and Floyd Landis this afternoon is going to have to learn that. Eddie Mazzolini getting a nice little gear in, and Francisco Mancebo has come to the front, but Cadell Evans has got onto the back of this group. Cadell Evans is burying himself in pain there. Levi Leipheimer has also been unhitched. There he is in the distance, just a little bit. Mancebo has actually got himself reorganized here and is giving this a shot. A lot of people think this rider can make the top three what about Michael Rasmussen back there the youngster who was looking for the king of the mountains I think he's looking for a place in Paris what about T-Mobile where are they now they were the big team who thought they put Armstrong under real serious pressure the other day on the slopes of the road up towards uh, Girard Mer they're not here anymore there's none of them here right now we've got two dangerous riders here the Mancebo and Valverde Basso I still think is waiting to pounce and might be the winner today Lance Armstrong is lifting it again. This is Cloden. He has gone bye-bye as well as all of the riders. They must be wondering what on earth has happened on this climb. Well, they were all rubbing their hands over the weekend. They were there's Yaks. Yaks has been caught now. Nobody is left. First now. Nobody is left in front of this group. Armstrong is tapping out a pace which is infernal Rasmussen looks fairly comfortable look at the face of Alejandro Valverde in about fourth place there he's wondering what is happening to his body do you know what I'd watch out on Michael Rasmussen that guy looks so cool he might well be going for another victory here what an amazing race this has been now this is Andreas Cloden in big trouble on the mountain Armstrong has said, right, well, this is the final selection, boys. I've done all the work, little stretch at the back, and he's going to the back now to assess just the, the strength of these riders. The one on your back means you're the team leader. In front is number 21, Basso. In front of him is 31, Mancebo. Uh, and 38 is Valverde. But what on earth has happened to number 11, Jan Ulrich? What's happened to number 11, Jan Ulrich? What's happened to number 14, Andreas Cloden? Or what's happened to number 19, Alexander Vinokurov? They are just hoping to survive here and try and limit their losses on this very first big mountain stage. Armstrong didn't stay at the back for very long there. He obviously felt that they didn't have the pressure in their legs to keep it going at the pace that he wants. Acceleration is putting Basso now into a bit of bother. Well, when you think this is day one here in the Alps, we thought it'd be a little bit of a tranquil day because today's the big, tomorrow's the big climbs. When we go over the Galibier, further down by about three quarters of a minute, we're looking now at the face of Jan Ulrich, clearly in trouble, but will fight to try and limit his losses, that's for sure. This is the yellow jersey. We've gone down the mountain here more than 12 minutes to locate Jens Voigt. Uh, blown to the world now, he could be 20 minutes down by the end. 
those legs of these three riders have exploded. They have completely exploded. Jens Voigt actually said, Phil, after that long breakaway of his a couple of days ago, he said, I'm going to have to pay for this breakaway, and I think today he is seriously paying. Rasmussen, the king of the mountains, he's scoring big points now in fourth, but I think he'll go for the win. Well, Armstrong has got to be very careful about Rasmussen because there's the bonuses on the finish line, and Armstrong and Rasmussen are only separated by around about 25 seconds, so Armstrong will have to pay very much attention to the position of Rasmussen when it comes down to the end. And let's not forget, Rasmussen is at the end of today's stage going to be in second place overall. And the Danish commentators must be going absolutely ballistic. Now these are the two boys in pink from T-Mobile. Look at the face of Ulrich here. I'm just again surprised that Cloak can even work with him. But he seems to be doing all of the work of these two. He's doing a lot of work. He keeps moving forward. Francisco Mancebo realises that if he can keep this group together, it's going to be very difficult for Lance Armstrong and Rasmussen to beat that man on the back there, number 38, Alejandro Valverde, just 25 years of age. But, you know, he is a magnificent professional. Last year, he was third overall in the Vuelta a España, but this year they've held him back a fraction and they wanted to bring him here to the Tour de France. They believe that sometime in the future, that man can take the victory to Spain. 15 minutes on the Mayo Jean, and he was with them at the start of this climb. He is now 15 minutes behind Jens Voigt as Lance Armstrong is looking to climb into his next yellow jersey in the Tour de France. It'll be number 72. And this is amazing. I have to say that Rasmussen looks simply great. And I think that guy's probably right. We are looking at Superman. <laughs> These are the two guys who thought they were going to play the tactical moves on Lance Armstrong in the Tour de France this year. Andreas Cloden and Jan Ulrich. But today they've been put very much on the defensive, as has Alexander Vinokurov, who has completely and utterly popped. The day's pain is almost over here, and Armstrong with his fast case is a flick of the arm saying, give me a hand. Nobody willing, he looks over saying, come on, give me a hand. They all look over, nobody wants to give anybody a hand. They are at the limits, but they're all thinking of winning the stage now. They forced Rasmussen, probably the least experienced, and I think Van Sable will try to go off the back if he can. I'm not sure they can lift the speed anymore. Oh, it's steep in the corner here as they go around the inside of that bend. They'll go into this tunnel, and once they come out of the tunnel, they'll see that and that is the banner that indicates one kilometer on the flat stages that's 60 seconds here it's going to be about two and a half minutes here comes the flotilla of motorbikes they have witnessed an extraordinary stage of the Tour de France today and Armstrong racing into retirement and delivering as much pain as he ever did since 1999 only three riders have desisted everything here and now it is two from the same team. Surely when you've got two from the same team, you win the day. They should not be beaten, but I think they have to bear in mind this is Lance Armstrong's final Tour de France. He's got himself two minutes advantage over Jan Ulrich. I think he would like to finish this off with the victory of the stage. Team Il Balearis have got to try and do something rather special if they can, and I would like to see number 31 there moving to the front to set up the pace for Alejandro Valverde. But watch Rasmussen, Rasmussen's going. Well, that will cause a reaction now. It's still a long way out for the hill, but Michael Rasmussen, who's won one stage already when we went to the rest day, is trying again to take this one. They're right on him, and Valverde is on him first. He's the sprinter of the group. Very few climbers can sprint. He can. And another attack here by Rasmussen. This is the serious one this time. No, it's not. Valverde is still waiting. Armstrong watches. A little bit of an experience there for Rasmussen going too far out. You don't sprint at 750 metres to the line in a mountain top finish at the Tour de France. Valverde, though, very nervous, straight onto the wheel. He was waiting for the move. Watch out for a burst from number 31, Mancebo. Armstrong, currently, Phil, is in an ideal position. He's looking at everyone. He'll be looking at the muscle fibres of the guys in front of him. If he sees them twitch, he's ready to pounce. An ideal position to lose, I think, because they've got him pinned up against the barriers, but he's soon opened the door and he's gone. Quick reaction for Valverde. He's got to try and get it, but when Lance is angry, not many people get by him. Armstrong is racing to a victory, and look at the speed of that man. Can Valverde get on? I very much doubt it. Armstrong and Valverde are going to get separate times from the rest because they've raced clear of the field here. Now he's leading out, and Valverde is poised, and I think he's going to take him because he's checking where the others are before he makes a move. Lance Armstrong is determined to stamp his mark. He is the next yellow jersey. I don't think he's going to win the stage. I'm not sure. Look at Valverde. He's oh, in a nice position. He's hurting, but he's got the experience. Explosive legs of a sprinter. 
and it's coming now. Valverde is looking for the win. Armstrong has seconded that. He's given up. Alessandro Valverde wins an incredible stage. Lance Armstrong, same time. The rest all get separate times. What an amazing race. Armstrong back in yellow. Valverde looks like being the new man on the block. Well, it is also important for Armstrong to put a little bit of time between himself and Michael Rasmussen, and Ivan Vassa was the man expected to accompany Armstrong in the mountains, just as he did last year. Well, he was put under serious pressure this afternoon. He has survived. He's managed to limit his losses a fraction, but he's still going to be around about 45 seconds when he crosses the line. There is Armstrong, a moment to recover. He did what he had to do here this afternoon. He laid down the law. And still, look, the favourites are finishing. The clock is counting. This is Ivan Basso, who said he was going to attack today. Well, he's going to stay there now as the clock counts out. Almost a minute behind. It will be a minute behind. Jan Ulrich will be more than two minutes behind on the day. The yellow jersey will be half an hour behind when he gets up here. One minute exactly for Basso. That was Lance Armstrong. And here comes Levi Leipheimer. That was Lance's 22nd stage victory. And it could be the foundation of a tour victory again. Levi did a great ride. 114 back and he's right up amongst it. Levi rode very high up in the overall classification. And you know uh, Armstrong was very close to the stage victory there. He was looking for that 22nd stage victory. But I think more importantly, he was looking to put time over himself and everybody else in the race. And that, I have to say, has been a great success. Well, they're going to be coming up here for ages now. And the yellow jersey with them at the bottom, probably going to be 17 and a half at the last time. Check, it'd be 20 now. As Jörg Jatsk, who thought he might have had this stage one at the bottom of Porsche Bell, Ulrich has caught him now. So too Floyd Landis, Leonardo Peepoli, Cadell Evans. These are the boys in this group as they race to the line. A very select group, but look at the clock. That's what tells us the story today. Jaks, they take my hat off. He's had a great ride. And the laps of Valverde have overshadowed everybody. It's a cool finish, you see. It's even a little hill right to the line. Cadell Evans riding well today and giving us hope for the future. Eddie Mazzolini takes it at 2.15 on the line. Oh, my goodness me. A line being repeated with varying degrees of obscenity in a number of languages up and down the mountain as the riders rolled in behind the lead group. Alexander Vinokurov, who started the day 62 seconds behind Armstrong, was a bigger loser than his team leader, Jan Ulrich. Over five minutes had passed by the time he came across the line. And a look at the replay shows Armstrong's evident respect for the man who matched him when so many bigger names were cracking on the slopes of Courchevel. There's the stage result. Valverde, Armstrong, Rasmussen and Mancebo, that elite group, taking the top four places. And behind them, the widening gaps. Andreas Clurden, Floyd Landis and Jan Ulrich all finished together, 2.14 behind Armstrong. Christoph Moreau, second at the start, was nearly three minutes down. Then came Vinokurov, who rode in with Bobby Julik, the pair of them having lost 5 minutes 18 seconds in the last 12 kilometres. But a fabulous stage win for Valverde, and one that gave him the white jersey of the best young rider. Although on his debut tour, it looks like a competition he's already outgrown. Bueno, pues me siento que casi no tengo palabras para, para expresar esta gran victoria, que, que sin duda es muy importante para mí y para todo el equipo por ser una victoria aquí en el acto de Courchevel, que yo creo que es un acto durísimo, un puerto mítico del Tour y, y conseguir una victoria aquí es fenomenal. Está también mi compañero Paco, que, que ha demostrado que está, que está al 100%, está muy muy fuerte y, y yo creo que eso también es importante. Él tiene más, más experiencia que yo en un Tour y intentaremos ahí entre los dos pues, hacerlo lo mejor posible. Well, not even that's likely to be good enough, given the time the pair of them need to make up on Lance Armstrong. And if any underlining were needed as to just how emphatic his superiority was on this stage over everyone but that tiny group, we had the sight of two yellow jerseys in the race, one being presented to Armstrong on the podium, the other several kilometres back down the road and soaked in Jens Voigt's sweat as he suffered up the climb in it. And there's the impact of stage 10 on the overall standings. Armstrong back in the yellow jersey by 38 seconds ahead of Michael Rasmussen, with Ivan Basso third at 2 minutes 40, and Valverde now up into the top five, 3 minutes 16 back. Jan Ulrich, Andreas Kluden and Floyd Landis are all over four minutes down. Alexander Vinokurov has dropped 16th, six and a half minutes back, with Jens Voigt slipping from first to 72nd. 
Somebody asked me this morning, I said, what do you expect? I said, we're going to see surprises. We always see surprises on the first big day and, and you know, didn't disappoint. There were surprises, there were poor performances, and there were what we could say are exceptional performances. So uh, new faces, new names, uh, new characteristics that we have to watch for. It's dangerous for us because we don't know uh, those guys as well as we know the Vinos and the Bassos and the Ulrichs. But nonetheless, we'll just ride as a team and, and try to ride strong. Last question. You were you were expect you were hoping to get the yellow jersey. Now you probably want a stage uh, that that victory you're you're waiting for. Yeah, but uh, you know if I if I finish my season, finish my career without without a stage victory or uh, or an individual victory in in uh, 2005, yet I win the tour. Well, I'll be happy. So.